Thank you so much. Let me express my appreciation to each and every one of you for your presence and your prayers and the praise that has been lifted up to God on this morning, for God is indeed worthy to be praised. And how appropriate, amen, and how appropriate that the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People has the good sense to kick off its annual convention in prayer and praise because there's always been a relationship between the NAACP and the black church. And so I want to salute and how appropriate that I salute at this time the chairman of the board of the NAACP, the incomparable and ravishing leader who has blessed us not only with her brilliance and boldness, but also with her spiritual sagacity. And so I want to salute our board chair, the Reverend Dr. Rosalind Brock. God bless you. And we look forward to what God will say through you tonight. Amen, as we lift you up in prayer. We thank God for her and for her and her leadership. We also praise God for my beloved brother, Benjamin Todd Jealous, for the amazing way that God is using him, energizing this marvelous association, not only with his youth, but also with his gifts. Uh, he is a blessing to our time, and I thank God for the privilege of knowing him as a brother and as a friend, and so I salute our president and CEO. You heard an introduction or a presentation, as he stated, by that premier prophet, Dr. Amos C. Brown. First of all, you must know already that when it comes to preaching the gospel, there is none like Dr. Amos C. Brown. He bears well the name Amos, that eighth century prophet. And I thank God for him because of the fact that he has shown me uh, as my spiritual father what it means to have two eyes. He has shown me what it means to unite the spiritual and the social. And of course, uh, his leadership at Third Baptist Church in San Francisco, his leadership around this world is legendary and our world is a better place because of this protege of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He and Julian Bond can actually say they sat at the feet at Morehouse College of the drum major for justice Martin Luther King Jr. And so I thank God for him. The only issue I have uh, with my spiritual father right now is it's really jacked up when you hear an introduction and the introducer is much better than the one who's been introduced. And so I want to ask that you would pray for him, uh, that God would forgive him for preaching the introduction in such a way uh, that really is over now. And uh, so we're gonna pray that God would forgive Dr. Brown and then pray that God would forgive me because I enjoyed everything that he said. Uh, so I thank God for him and for his wonderful and laudable leadership. His wonderful wife is here also, Sister Jane. God bless you. I praise God for you. Let me also uh, acknowledge uh, the Reverend Dr. Nelson Rivers uh, for his leadership with our Religious Affairs Committee. Under his leadership, we're doing such amazing things. As a matter of fact, today, uh, all across this land, uh, there is a day of unity as the black church is taking its head out of the sand as it relates to HIV and AIDS. And so I want to salute uh, the Reverend Dr. Nelson Rivers for leading us to take our heads out of the sand uh, with this most crucial issue. I also want to say thank you to our uh, Religious Affairs Chairperson, uh, Rabbi David Saperstein, for his leadership and for the amazing way that God is using him to unite us and bring us together as we move forward. Uh, the music has been especially powerful and rich, and so I want to uh, go ahead because we have so much to do today. And so if I have any good sense, I will treat you uh, just like uh, Kim Kardashian does husbands. This won't be long. So let me uh, share with you uh, as briefly as possible. This, of course, is a memorial praise worship where we are reflecting on those who have gone before us. And so for a few moments with your prayers, I want to talk about our heritage of handling headwinds, our heritage of handling headwinds. I 
I was inspired to speak from this topic by an incident that occurred just yesterday. I was flying from Dallas Love Field to Houston Hobby Airport. And as soon as we boarded the plane, the pilot had us to look outside of our windows because outside of the window, there was a dust storm right there at Love Field. He then got over the PA system and warned each and every one of us that not only was there a dust storm on the ground, but when we began our ascent, we were going to be met with a thunderstorm. And so he was encouraging us to hurry up, get on the plane so we could take off immediately because there was a dust storm on the ground. There was going to be thunderstorms that would greet us as we ascent, ascended. And then thirdly, he said there were headwinds that we had to deal with once we reached cruising altitude. All of this was bad news, but the bad news was magnified by the reality that not only were we dealing with those three factors that were foes to my journey, but on top of all of that, we were on a small plane, a crop duster, if you please. So boarding a crop duster, and please bear in mind, parenthetically, to quote Dr. King, that it's not that I lack faith in God when I'm traveling, it's just that I have more experience with God on the ground than in the air. And so with that being the case, I was immediately soured in spirit by the fact that we were on a crop duster. And on this crop duster, we had to deal with a dust storm on the ground. We had to deal with thunderstorms during the ascent. And then we had to face headwinds once we reached cruising altitude. And all of this was taking place within the confines of a crop duster aircraft. Needless to say, my brothers and sisters, I could not help but reflect on our heritage as a people because we've had often to deal with dust storms on the ground. During our ascent, there have been thunderstorms. In a real sense, even at cruising altitude, we've had to handle ahead winds. No wonder Langston Hughes, with ungrammatical profundity, looked through the eyes of a mother at her son and shifted the metaphor as it were recognizing we were dealing with headwinds and said to that son well son I tell you life for me ain't been no crystal stair it's had tacks in it splinters boards torn up places with no carpet on the floor bare but all the while I've been a climbing on reaching landings turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no lights so boy don't you quit now don't you sit down on the steps because you find it's kind of hard I still climbing I still going in life for me ain't been no crystal stair we have a heritage of being haunted by headwinds not only Langston Hughes but who was it James Weldon Johnson a past president of the association who in his classic lift every voice and sing looked at our headwinds and said we have come over a way that with tears has been watered we have come treading our feet to the blood of the slaughtered in a real sense you cannot even look at our heritage and history without understanding that we've often been haunted by headwinds our progress has often been precluded by opposition and overwhelming odds we know something about dust storms on the ground thunderstorms during our ascent and headwinds when we find ourselves at cruising altitude and and as we gather here in Houston, Texas, yes, Texas, we are in Texas, and in Texas, we know a whole lot about headwinds in Texas. You are gathering in a state that leads the nation, bragging, we brag about leading the nation in the number of millionaires, but we also lead the nation in the number of children in poverty who do not have access to health care, and so we know something about headwinds wins because of the headwinds of a wealth gap in this state that is a microcosm of the wealth gap in this nation. We know something about headwinds. Texas leads the nation in the number of people who have been exonerated by DNA evidence because of in Hingham High, Texas, we so are 
so concerned with convictions that we overlook the need for justice. We know something about headwinds in Texas and so Sister Chair and Mr. President, I'm glad you dared to bring the association to Texas because in Texas we are dealing with dust storms on the ground, thunderstorms in our ascent and headwinds during cruising altitude. We know something about headwinds. Well, this is is a prayer and memorial breakfast and so I hope you don't mind if I take a text right quick I, I'm not gonna preach long but there is a text that will speak to our handling ahead winds the Bible lets us know when you get home check out Genesis chapter 26 because the book says that child the promise Isaac the son of Abraham and Sarah in chapter 26 there is a famine in the land on top of that every time that he tries to dig wells. The text lets us know that he's met with foes. And so he's got to deal with a famine and he's got to deal with foes. I can hang out there right quick because in a real sense, famine and foes equal headwinds. And there is a famine in the land as we look at the unequal recovery that is taking place in the economy. There's a famine in the land. The uh, unemployment rate of Africa African Americans continues to hover at depression like statistics and there is no targeted effort on the part of the government to ensure that we address that sad and sinful reality in this country. There is a famine in the land. You are in the state of Texas. Welcome to Texas because right here in Texas there are more, there are more payday and car title loan predators than there there are McDonald's, Burger King, and Dairy Queens combined. That's right here in Texas. There is a famine in the land. And the Bible lets us know that Isaac had to deal with the famine. But on top of that, every time he tried to redig old wells and get fresh water, he met up with foes. And so there is a famine, but we've also got to deal with foes. You recognize there are foes because whenever you have an obstructionist Congress that is determined to do only one thing. Was it not sinful when one of the leaders of Congress said his number one priority is to ensure that President Obama is a one-term president? I mean, really, there's a famine in the land and your number one priority is not to deal with the famine but to get rid of the job, to remove from one job the President of the United States instead of creating more jobs jobs for all of our people. You mean to tell me that is your number one priority? We've got to deal with foes and we've got to deal with famine. Please don't miss the foes because the foes are determined to divide us and send us on a hunt going after wedge issues. No, my pastor would call them red herrings. Please don't get it twisted. This whole same-sex marriage is a wedge issue. It's a red herring and the association did the right thing a few weeks ago when we stood and said this nation must be one of justice for all. It's about equal protection under the law and we're not going to get so distracted by who people sleep with that we're not concerned about the houses where they find themselves sleeping because we recognize there's a bigger thing going on and that is voter suppression in the land. They are so arrogant our foes as to say in the state of Pennsylvania that when they engage in voter suppression through the so-called voter ID law it gave, the, uh, it gave Pennsylvania over to the Republican Party in the November election right here in Texas. Welcome to Texas. Texas. I told you there are headwinds in Texas. Right here in Texas, the Justice Department did the right thing in shooting down the voter ID law because it's a headwind. How do I know it's a headwind? Because in the state of Texas, the proposed voter ID law had the nerve to say you could register or you could vote if your ID was a, was, had, was a gun license, but you could not vote if you had a student ID. ID going to Paul Quinn.
Quinn College or Houston Tillotson or Wiley College. What am I trying to say? It's a headwind. And we've got to be more concerned about expressing our voice as to people voting than we are as to where people sleep. Because if we're not careful, that red herring will lead us down a wrong path because we will fall prey to the headwind. But I'm so glad our text is talking to me because the text lets us know that Isaac in the face of the headwind, God spoke to Isaac and God told Isaac, your future is going to be grand and great. And the book lets us know that Isaac had the good sense in chapter 26 to redig the wells that were dug by his father, Abraham, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. May we have the good sense in this memorial breakfast to go back and redig some old wells. Let's redig the wells of justice and advocacy that were dug by Thurgood Marshall, W.E.B. Du Bois. I